So Todd Shield is going to come to us today to help you diversify your practice, talk about disability. Once again, this is the first of four series, and um, I'll let you take it away, Todd. I think you're on the wrong sharing screen, though, because it's kind of the the one where I can see oh. your next your next slide. So you had it right okay. the first time. <laughs> I had it right the first time. All right. Well, let's do that then. All right. Okay, so Todd, perfect. take it away, my friend. Well, thank you, Phil. I, I appreciate it. And thank you guys for uh, being a part of this. I apologize. My garage door just opened, so my dog will stop barking in 30 seconds when my wife walks through the door. Uh, that's on uh, recorded for posterity's sake, by the way, too. What we do here at North Central DI, we are the, the disability partner for 3 Mark. We handle all things disability. We are your one-stop shop when it comes to income protection for uh, for 3 Mark. And we'll walk through how this thing all plays out. What I'm going to share today is, is what you see on your screen, DI 101 and sales ideas. We're going to start out at basic entry-level things, and it's a little bit like algebra class. We're going to build on top of these over the next several sessions um, until you get a full training on disability insurance, or as we would much prefer to call it, income protection, and um, all of the things that are associated with that. During this training, here's what I will tell you. If you have a question during the training, let's not wait until the end to ask those questions. Jump in and interrupt me. Say, Todd, time out here. You know, let me let me know. Um, with my screen share, Phil, I can't see when a hand is raised, so maybe you can monitor that for me as we go through, or feel free yep. to, to throw it in the in the chat box. Um, but ask those questions as as we go through those, because it's easier to address them at that point in time than trying to funnel back through this this presentation. So a um, little background on myself, um, I, am, I am the sales director here at North Central DI. I have been in the disability industry for just about 19 years now and, um, and have made different stops throughout my, my career on the, on the carrier side of the fence. So um, we, like I said, we do all things disability insurance and we want to be your trusted partner when it comes to that protection. Here's my question for you today. If today was your last paycheck, What's your plan? This is a great icebreaker and a great door opener when you're in front of prospects or clients to initiate the conversation regarding income protection. As you will hear me say over and over again through these training sessions, I, I try to stray away from the term disability insurance. That brings in a negative connotation. If, if I ask you, you know, uh, what does a disability mean to you? You're likely gonna tell me that it means being in a wheelchair. And that's actually the furthest thing from the truth. I'm simply saying that a disability is the inability to go to work because you're too sick or hurt. It doesn't matter how it happens. It doesn't mean that you're in a wheelchair. And it definitely doesn't mean that you'll never work again. It just simply means that you can't go to work because you're too sick or hurt. So we refer to it as income protection or paycheck protection. Those are the key terms that I would have you use when you're speaking with your clients. But the question comes back to, if today was your last paycheck, what's your plan? And then here's the hardest part is that you know, for me, I have to be quiet and I have to listen to hear what these people have to say. And you're gonna hear all sorts of things and all sorts of, of basically excuses, if you will, when it comes to what their plan happens to be. They're gonna say, well, we, we've got savings. Okay, you, you literally have a lifetime's worth of savings right now. If that's the case, why haven't you retired? Um, here's the, and, and here's a, here's a great thing to kind of throw back at them. This is a way to think about how catastrophic a disability can be. If you have been disciplined enough to save 10% of your paycheck and over a 10 year period, that could literally be wiped out in one year of a disability. Is that what you meant your savings, uh, to do for you? Is that how you had it planned? Probably not. You're going to hear, well, my spouse, um, you know, my, my spouse will still work and we, we can live off of, of his or her income. So you're telling me that every dollar that you make right now is going into the bank or it's going into, you're not using it for anything that you possibly need. We know that's not true. Second is that if you become disabled, is your spouse going to be able to do their actual job, the amount, you know, work every, every minute that they're currently working now or be able to put in more hours because you're not working? Probably not. They're going to need to be around to help take care of you, get you to appointments, do those types of things. So that's not a reality either. We'll talk about the I have it at work um, excuse and, and we'll dig, dig deeper into that. 
But basically, they're going to talk themselves out of every possible realistic opportunity that they have. What it comes back to is we need to ensure your paycheck. We need to make sure that your income is properly protected. And the only way to do that is through a disability insurance policy. So that's one way to open up conversation. And we'll talk, we'll talk about several more of those towards the end of the presentation too on, on how to bring up this um, bring up this idea to clients. When we think about disability insurance, this, our, our income is the base of, of every financial plan that's out there. It doesn't matter who you are, what you do for a living, we are all a function of our income. Nothing occurs until we have a paycheck, right? And what we find over and over and over again is people are, are focusing a lot on the, per, in, in this illustration, the protection aspect and the future planning aspect. They're doing a ton of, of, of um, retirement planning, personal investments, and we're not insuring the thing that's making it possible, which is our income. Would those plans that have been put in place, and, and maybe you've sold some of these, right, and, and haven't thought about the disability piece of it, are those plans going to stay in place in the event that we don't have a disability policy or have income to fund those things? They won't stay in, typically they won't stay in, in, uh, in, in there for very long. So we want to make sure, again, that those things can be funded even in the event that we're not able to work. That can only be done through a disability policy. So the question then becomes, well, what's at stake? And this is a great chart. I'm not big on stats. I'm not, you know, big on saying, well, you know, you have a one in four chance of becoming disabled for 90 days or more during your lifetime. That doesn't sell any policies. It makes a point, but it doesn't sell any policies. But clients also need to understand what is at stake for them. What are your future potential earnings? If we've got a 35-year-old making $100,000 with minimal salary increases, they've got a $6.6 .6 million asset at stake here, right? If I, if you tell any client, hey, you, you know, you've got a $6.6 .6 million house or you've got a $6.6 .6 million whatever, would you insure it? 100% every time that they would. Well, you are the $6.6 .6 million asset in this scenario. Why are we not insuring that, okay? We need to take the steps to properly protect that, that um, income and uh, the things that that income is gonna do not only for you, but your, for your family. Then we jump into, and I like this illustration too, because I think this hits home, is what, what the disability means to you in terms of expenses. So on the left, we've got uh, the light blue bar, which is your income, and the dark blue bar, which is your expenses. The vertical dash line is when the disability occurs. And then all of a sudden we see the swap. Our income goes down, our expenses go up. Our expenses are going up because we've got doctor's visits. We may have surgeries, we may have medication, we may have you know, physical uh, rehab or occupational rehab, whatever, whatever it might be. All of those things cost us money and we don't have a steady paycheck to pay for those things. It flips. Those things don't have to occur in the event that we actually have a proper paycheck protection put in place. So let's talk for any questions about this before we move before we move forward with just it's the Tom, basics of of how a disability policy is what why it's needed so so much. Yeah, Todd, I, I would just say you know because you're talking to a lot of life insurance agents here, uh, and a lot of times when they're doing the pyramid or the foundation, so to speak, everyone always says it's mm -hmm. you know death, you know. But I think when we talk about from behind the scenes the statistics of of people, you're more than likely uh, going to get injured uh, or sick versus uh, death during your working years. So I, I think uh, what we need to understand is, is that some people that I know on the call, uh, unfortunately, came from uh, an organization where they would uh, discredit the idea of a traditional disability policy to sell something with living benefits. So... Okay whether you're going to explain that later or if you have a brief second to explain living benefits. Yeah, living yeah. benefits versus this. I think yeah. that's important for people to understand. So you are you are correct there, Phil. Um, so we do find life insurance contracts that have a disability benefit that, that is built into them 
or they have waiver of premium on on dis on the life insurance policies. Well, waiver of premium simply just picks up the the premium payments in the event that the for the life insurance policy in the event that the client is disabled. My understanding is that if you know you guys are doing a, a you know cash value stuff like you know on on ULs, a lot of times it's only funding the bare bare minimum. It's not doing the overfunding piece for them. So uh, there's there's a problem there, okay, uh, potentially. However, uh, the, the more important piece is that if they have a living benefit rider, such as a disability policy or a disability rider that you can add to that life insurance policy, what we find time and time again is that these are not um, robust. The definitions of disability are poor and you are very limited to the amount of coverage that a client can obtain. There's a, a benefit cap on it of say $3,000 or $5,000 a month. Well, that's fantastic, but what if your client's making $150,000 annually, a $3,000 benefit is not gonna get all their bills paid for them. So uh, Phil, you bring up a great point there that an individual disability policy serves a purpose and, and it's really the three-legged stool of what if I die? What if I'm unable to work? And what if I outlive my income? There's there's your <laughs> retirement planning, there's your disability insurance, and there's your life insurance, right? Um, and I, I don't want to sit on a two-legged stool, and I don't want a stick as one of those legs. And that's how I would refer to a living benefit disability rider on a life insurance policy. I'm, I'm sitting on a stick for a leg instead of on a, a, a nice, healthy post. Um, I, I'm a big enough guy. I need that. I need that big healthy <laughs> post, right? I feel you so, there. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, I, I got big boy problems, you know. But uh, <laughs> at the end of the day, that that's what I would say when it comes to the riders that are available within specific life insurance policies that you may have access to. And I'll I'll make one other point too, because uh, there are uh, products out there that have the free critical illness riders. So there's long term care riders, which is usually after retirement, not before, but critical only covers like heart attack, stroke, cancer, you know, third degree burns, but stuff that we have here, which I know you'll touch on, uh, revolves around occupational stuff. And so Correct. when you think about the people that we want to focus on, we'll have action steps. We'll talk about that, but just understand that there are certain places where you're going to need this way more than you would need the quote unquote living benefits provided in some of the products that we also offer. So um, yep. with that, I'll let you dive back in. Yeah. So I just wanted to add and the I'm two a cents. Big, by the way, I am a giant proponent of critical illness. Um, I, I love what it does and uh, it serves its own purpose, but it is not the, as Phil was saying, it's not the end all be all that will cover a client because if you don't have one of those covered conditions, you're getting paid nothing. <laughs> yep. So yep. Uh, this is where disability can cover you in the event that you can't do exactly what you do, which we'll talk about in a second. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the, the policy forms. There are two ways that a policy can be filed with disability insurance. They are non-cancelable and guaranteed renewable. Um, non-cancelable and guaranteed renewable says that these premiums are guaranteed. The carrier can never raise your rates as long as you are paying your premiums. They can never touch those. If your premium is $100 a month, it will be $100 a month until this policy ceases to exist when it expires at age 65 or age 67 based upon whatever carrier happens, uh, whatever their policy states, okay? The policy features are also guaranteed. Um, so this is this is a great policy, okay? We're, we're guaranteeing them that their, their premiums are never gonna increase. Now that comes at an extra cost, okay? I want you to keep that in mind. Then we have a guaranteed renewable policy. Okay, so we're taking out the non-cancelable piece of this. The policy features are still guaranteed. They can't change those on you. And the premiums are guaranteed as long as you are paying those premiums. However, the carrier does have the opportunity to increase premiums on a client. Now, here's the dirty secret, all right? Carriers don't do that. They just, they flat out don't. So what I would tell you is a vast majority of the time, a guaranteed renewable policy is good enough for just about everybody. About the only time where we want to push non-cancelable on somebody is if they are a physician. Because that physician market is so 
grossly penetrated that you don't want that client to have a policy that another agent could come in from behind the scenes and say, well, man, Todd puts you in this policy and it's guaranteed renewable and the carriers could raise the rates on you. Um, not telling them that they don't, they don't ever go do this on you. Um, and you know, so on and so forth. We don't want them creating doubt with your client and we don't want them poking holes in your program. Guaranteed renewable works just about perfectly for everybody else. I will tell you on all of the personal disability policies that I have, every one of them are guaranteed renewable. I'm not worried about it. I am at hundred percent. I'm not worried about it. Let's talk for a second about how, if a carrier were to ever raise rates, here's what has to occur. Okay. First of all, if they were ever to raise rates, they would give themselves a black eye in the industry and nobody would ever want to write their policies ever again. Okay. The trust would be gone. And so they're not going to do it. Um, if they ever would decide to do it though, they can't just pick on one client or they can't just pick on one occupation. They would have to say everybody who falls in this particular occupation class. Okay. So let's say it's an occupation class three. Okay. That doesn't mean anything to you, but that could include people such as nurses and dental hygienists and all of those people. They would have to go to every department of insurance at every state and say, we need to raise rates because we're seeing poor claims in this occupation class. And they would have to raise them for everybody in that entire occupation class. They don't do it. They just don't do it. Okay. Um, it is easier for a carrier to just eat whatever they have on the books, come out with a new policy that is repriced and move forward with it. That's the way that it ends up uh, happening. So don't, be psyched out or don't read the the jargon that's out on the internet when you google it to say that if you don't have a non-cancellable policy that it's a it's a piece of garbage because it's not it's flat out not we've been doing this for 20 years at north central di and uh, we will not wave upon how we feel about guaranteed renewable policies versus non-cancellable policies having a non-cancellable policy i was speaking about this with an agent earlier today it's kind of like putting insurance on your insurance. You're paying right. more to guarantee that they're never gonna raise the rates again. Okay, well, they don't raise rates on guaranteed renewable policies. So but why would I spend, why would I put insurance on my insurance? It just doesn't make sense. So anyway, I, I digress, but uh, that's, my, that's my take on the two types of policies that are available in the disability world. Hey Todd, uh, real quick, cause I know we have some, uh... Uh, frugal clients sometimes, but we also have clients who like security. So um, what I would say is, is uh, what is the average uh, premium percentage, if you have an idea, the difference between yeah. non-can versus just guaranteed renewable? Because um, yep. I think that'd be important to understand. Yeah, absolutely. So it, it, it's, um, I hate to say this, but it is variable based upon the carrier. All right. Yep. Um, but if, I would say in the most part, guaranteed renewable versus non-cancelable is anywhere between 10 to 20 percent. OK. So if you think about enough. it, if I've already been paying 10 percent less than I would have been paying and I have my policy for 20 years, and even if they do raise the rates a little bit, is it more than the 10 percent I saved over the course of that 20 years already? Probably it probably wouldn't exceed that number, you know. Mm -hmm. So, again, they don't do it, but. I want to make sure that you're aware of that. And, and what you see online is if you don't have a non-cancelable policy, it's absolute garbage. That's that's 100 percent not true. OK, that's that's fiction <laughs> is, is what it is. So don't uh, don't believe it. So let's move into the, the parts of a disability policy. So this is really the DI 101 piece as as we talk here. What is an elimination period? Okay, this sounds a little bit remedial. Okay, but again, we have to build on these small things in order to have you understand uh, contract. We can't go right from, from addition to calculus. It just doesn't work that way. Elimination period is the amount of time that the client must be disabled before your payments begin. All right, this is their deductible, if you will, uh, on your health insurance policy. But instead of measuring it in dollars, we measure it in days. Okay. Typical 90 uh, uh, elimination periods are uh, 90 uh, or 30 days all the way out to 365 days. But I will tell you that a 90 day elimination period is the most common elimination period in the industry. Okay. The longer the elimination period, the lower the premium. 
the shorter the elimination period, the higher the premium. Now, one may think that if I have a 90 day wait and I double that to a 180 day wait, that I would save a tremendous amount of money by doing that, by just waiting that extra period of time. In the world, the actual world of disability pricing, there is very little savings from going from 90 days to 180 days. So I would push the 90 day wait. And what you would find is if you go to a 60 90 day wait, we're gonna see a pretty big hike in premium. So they kind of, that's where they want clients to be. You're on the hook for the first 90 days. After that, we're gonna get you on the claim and start making those payments to you. Then we get to the benefit period. That is the amount of time that the client will be paid for every valid claim that they have. What I want you to keep in mind is that the client is not entitled to just one claim and the policy is over. They can make a claim for any period of time. They can return to work. They can make a claim for the same issue or a different issue as long as they've satisfied their elimination period all over again. So this is available to them for their entire working career. It's not just a, well, I used it for my maximum benefit period of uh, five years or or whatever it may be, and the policy is done. Nope. If I've returned to work, I'm entitled to make another claim if I need to. I just simply have to be back to work. Um, typical policies have benefit periods. Uh, we have six months and one year, but you really what we see is the two, five, 10 years. And most people want, you know, an age 65, an age 67, or an age 70 benefit period. Make sure that if something larger happens to them and they are not able to return to work, that they have that period of, of payment for a long, for that period of time until they would hit retirement age. Again, from a pricing perspective, the longer the benefit period, the higher the premium. The shorter the benefit period, the lower the premium. And this one is really flexible with us because, um, you know, we would love to have everybody in an age 65 benefit. But the reality is, is that for some occupations and some people who are, are older age, it, that's not reasonable for them. It becomes too expensive. So what we want to do is make sure that we, we put a policy, a client in a proper policy that's affordable to them and still provides adequate coverage for, for what they may need. So we will work with you and we will show you every policy we send out has an alter, alternative uh, coverage summary built into it. So you can see if you made adjustments to the policy, what that premium would end up being. Then we get into the benefit amount, right? As you can imagine, that's the amount of the money that the client receives in the event that a valid claim is, is actually uh, is made. Here's how they determine benefit amount. And this is determined at time of underwriting, not at time of claim. If the client is a W-2 employee, we would use their gross income. Sounds pretty straightforward, no problem there. This is where it gets just a little bit tricky. If they are 1099 or self-employed, we have to use their net income, which is after expenses and before taxes. You guys are insurance producers. You understand what that number happens to be. So um, there are other policies and we'll get into this in future sessions uh, for self-employed people. We can use business products to ensure a higher percentage of their income because we can't use their gross income because they have tax write-offs built into their, into their uh, actual net income. So that's how underwriting looks at, um, at those particular clients that are 1099 and self-employed. Now, there are two ways that benefits can be paid out. What we refer to as a base benefit, these uh, are basically guaranteed benefits, all right? Um, if you have a valid claim, they will pay you that full amount and it cannot be offset by other benefits. Those benefits could be Social Security DI, workers' comp, or a uh, or group plan. Okay. Hey, Todd. Or, yeah. And just real quick, um, I had a question that was sent to me. Uh, Absolutely. What is the, what's the typical underwriting ages? Like, when where do they start? Is it, and where do you typically see most of the uh, people starting to get DI? Yep. So, great, great question there. They the, most carriers will say 18 to 60 are issue ages. Okay. One of our carriers can can issue up to age 64. And we have uh, Lloyd's who we've got a session specifically for them. Um, Lloyd's can do anything and they will actually issue all the way through age 75. <laughs> now, again, the <laughs> the higher the age, the higher the premium. So when you see those upper ages, 
Yeah. Be sitting before you open those up and see the premium on, on some of those. <laughs> um, typical ages that we see them, I mean, it, it runs the gamut. I We run into 20-year-olds. Um, mm -hmm. if, if their advisor is, is on their game, catch them as early as they possibly can. What we want to do, is, and, and we'll talk about this in a second, get them a, a starter policy with future increase options. So as their income increases, their disability policy can maintain pace with that, right? It doesn't get any cheaper than right now. <laughs> that, that's the bottom line with disability insurance. So lock them in as early as we possibly can. When we're talking about the medical market, we're typically seeing them ages 30 to 35, um, towards the end of their residency program or when they sign their first big contract. Um, but we do see a lot of people in their early 40s. Once we kind of hit that age 45 and, and above mark, that's where it tends to start getting a little bit expensive. And sometimes we have to make sacrifices in the policy to keep premium down and, and maintain its affordability. But that's a fantastic question. Absolutely. Great answer. Great answer. The so the second the second way that can be paid out is if we have a social insurance rider, and that could be offset by a, a federal social security DI claim or workers comp. Uh, what we try to do, unless from a premium perspective, it just doesn't make sense. We try to put all of our clients in a base benefit type of policy that would have guaranteed payouts and anything that they would receive from workers uh, potential workers comp claim or from a federal social security DI claim would simply be gravy on top. So. That's how we approach we approach that. Big one. And and the, Phil had hinted on this earlier. What is the definition of disability? What does it take for a client to actually get paid? Um, you will hear all sorts of carriers and, and you can Google this stuff and, and they're going to say, well, it's it's ONOC and it's your OC and it's regular OC. Well, what does it all mean? Well, the reality is, is that it doesn't matter. We have to focus on the contract, not on what they are, are deeming their definition to say from a, a title standpoint, okay? We wanna look at the contractual verbiage that's in there. So we are gonna talk about definitions of disability in order from best to uh, worst, okay? The first would be an own occupation. Say it's to age 65, say it's to age 67 or age 70, doesn't matter. Own occupation to age 65 uh, um, is the best, okay? That own occupation to age 65, I'm going to back up a step. Own occupation to age 65 would, would allow a client, okay, to be on claim and earn an income doing something else outside of their normal occupation, okay? So here's, here's the example that I give all the time. You've got the... Uh, you've got the doctor, okay, and and um, they can't, they can no longer do their their physician duties, whatever it happens to be, it doesn't matter, and they're they're no longer can do that, and they say, hey, Phil, I want to become an agent with with Valor. No problem. They would be allowed to maintain all of their benefits based upon their inability to do their physician job duties, even though they would be making a lot of commission selling policies through Phil. Okay, that's a great definition of own occupation. Next to that is own occupation and not working in another occupation. So they are deemed disabled again if they cannot do their own occupation, but they are not allowed to go earn money from another occupation outside of their own. Okay, so they need to make a choice. Do you stay on claim or do you go work somewhere else? Well, it may come back to could whatever I, I could go do in another occupation uh, could I earn more money doing that than I would on claim? That's the choice that the client has to make. Um, and, and they would never be forced to do that. It would be at their at their choice. Then we get into own occupation for two years or five years. So to start the policy, it would be their own occupation for the first two years or five years. And then after that, it would be any reasonable occupation. Not, not necessarily ideal. Now, this does come into play when we run into some of our blue collar and and um, and manual labor type of occupations. This helps keep premium down and it can accomplish the goal for them, but it's it's just not quite as good as the the own occupation definitions that are that are out there for the length of the benefit periods. Any occupation, man, we we want to try to avoid this if if at all possible. Any occupation is 
any occupation that you have been trained, experienced, or educated to do. All right. So there, there's some subjectivity to that. All right. And when we put this in the hands of a claims analyst, it doesn't always bode well for the client. And so we want to try to avoid that. Now, that does fall, that definition of any occupation typically follows the two year or five year. So that transitions. All right. However, the carriers have, have really put in an extra layer of protection. And I don't have it mapped out in this presentation, but just so you're fully aware, they state any occupation that you've been trained, experienced, or educated for, and would that occupation replace at least 60% of your prior income? That's the extra level of protection they're putting in there, which I truly appreciate. So we get the, we get the question all the time, well, if I have any, any occupation definition, are they going to make me go be a, a door greeter at Walmart? My question is, have you ever been a door greeter at Walmart? No? Okay, then don't worry about it. Um, or are they going to go make me make me flip burgers at McDonald's? Have you ever flipped burgers at McDonald's or another fast food chain? If you haven't, don't worry about it. It's not a problem. It's only experience, education, or training. Okay, And they've added in this extra layer of it needs to replace at least 60% of your prior income. Would flipping burgers at McDonald's replace more than 60% of your income being an insurance producer? I hope not. <laughs> uh, right. Uh, if, if so, we need to get into every training session Phil has here. Uh, but, you know, so that that's what we're talking about. Don't don't get spooked out by it because they have that extra layer of protection with the 60 percent replacement of income. All right, Todd, I got a, a couple questions for you. OK, so yeah, fire one, away. one is mine and one is in the chat. So the first one uh, I'll. The one in the chat's probably a little bit uh, easier. So what happens if a client's unable to pay the premium after a certain years? Uh, is it like a term policy? Like, will they lose the DI uh, or does it carry on? So great uh, question. Uh, it, is, it is much like a term policy. They would lose, they would lose the policy. Um, in a future session, uh, in fact, towards the end of the next session, we will talk about the opportunity where return of premium is available. And nice. if a policy terminates with return of premium, they're still entitled to a percentage of that back. But without return of premium, they they just lose their they lose their policy like a like a term life policy. That's that's a good question. All right. And the the next question is: Is you have a physician? This is my question. So I, okay, for funsies, yeah, physician making four or five hundred thousand dollars a year. All right, they purchase a policy to protect sixty percent of their income. And then uh, all of a sudden they have the, uh, the, the philanthropic side of them uh, both burst through and they want to go join the Peace Corps. Yep. Uh, they keep their policy, they're paying the premiums, and then disabling event happens uh, under the new pretenses. What happens from the DI side? So great, great question there. They've changed, they've changed occupations. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, they are looking, so you originally qualify, your occupation class is set when you originally qualified. So they would get physician rates based upon whatever their specialty was. Um, their definition of disability is, it would be, we would set it up to be because they started out as a doctor. We would try to do own occupation to age 65 or age 67. Yeah. Um, but it comes back to what were your job duties at time of claim, not at time of underwriting. So if they couldn't do whatever it was they were doing in the Peace Corps, they would be considered disabled. You do not have to provide income documentation at time of claim. So you are entitled to your full benefit at that period of time, no matter what your income happens to be. Likely, they would not be making nearly that amount of money being in the Peace Corps. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right. So, yeah, that's a that's a great that's a great example. hundred percent. If they change occupation, it's what were you doing for your job with your job duties at time of claim? not when the policy was taken out um, initially. Very good question. Then we get into the social security definition. Oh man, we want to we want to avoid that. Um, social security is is pretty harsh. And in fact, I'm going to fast forward a little bit here because I kind of walked through these um, as we went through. But here's here's social security. Social security says that you are unable to work in any occupation in the national economy, ouch. Or you were expected to die in the next 12 months, even more ouch. 
by the way, there is no relations to earnings clause from your prior job. So they don't care what those jobs could pay. So if they say that, you know, hey, you've been, um, you know, you could go be a door greeter at Walmart and that's going to pay you, you know, your $12 an hour based on minimum wage or, or whatever, uh, that's what you have to go do, even if it only replaces 2% of your income. They don't care. So uh, this is why we don't rely on Social Security DI. <laughs> because it's impossible to get on and they don't pay you anything and their definitions are absolutely terrible. You know, I think we can all agree. Don't lean on the government for much of anything. Right. At the end of the day. Right. Uh, th this isn't a talk about policy or politics. I'm just saying if you rely on the government for your, for your income protection, you're, you're, you're not going to like the outcome. That's what it comes down to. So those are the main parts of a disability policy. Okay, now let's talk about the riders or the add-ons that we can put into a policy to customize it for a client. And this is really where a policy can earn its keep. So as, as we talked about earlier, how the uh, maybe a life insurance policy has a disability rider on it, there, that is a cookie cutter policy. There is no way to customize that thing for a client. We can customize policies to, to be 100% theirs, to do for them exactly what they need, and pay for the things that they need and don't pay for the things that uh, are unwanted. The first one that I want to talk about is a residual or a partial disability benefit rider. To me, this one is kind of non-negotiable. If it is available to a client, we will put it on the policy. And here, here is why. It, um, it, it protects these clients in the event, so basically without it, you can only claim on a total disability. That would be your inability to go to work. Well, what happens if you can work part-time? right? If you can work part-time, you are not considered totally disabled. But if I can only work part-time, I'm probably going to show a loss of income. This is where residual disability benefits come into play. We know from an industry standpoint, and there's not one carrier out there that, can, that, would, that would state this any differently. Every carrier has more residual claims on their books than they do total disability claims somebody becomes sick or hurt, or they're going through, as an example, they're going through a cancer treatment, um, you know, and they want to continue to work through that treatment. They're going to need time off uh, here and there because of their treatments. And if they're feeling well enough, they're going to go back to work. That would not be a total disability claim. Okay. But they're going to show a loss of income because they can only work two days a week, or they can only work three days a week. So what ends up happening is the pop with this rider, the policy pays an equal percentage of the income lost. So if you lose 60% of your income, you get 60% of your benefit. If you lose 40%, you get 40% of your benefit. It is designed to help make up that difference to get you back to that kind of take home pay type of, uh, of situation. So it is a very important rider and we will recommend it on every policy where it's available. Another big one is the future increase option. Uh, did another question come in, Phil? I thought I uh, I, I, yeah, I was going to say I okay. answered it. Yeah, it was okay. uh, one right. we talked about a little earlier, so I was just okay. respecifying. Sounds good. Future increase options. This is another important one. We talked about this just a little bit ago where the client can increase their coverage without medical insurability. That is huge. All right. Um, we are literally one doctor's visit away from never being insurable ever again. So we want to protect that as much as we possibly can. And having a future increase option within a policy is a tremendous idea. Another popular one is cost of living option, or what we refer to as COLA. And, and this uh, once a client goes on claim, this increases their benefit, uh, typically around 3% is the um, is the number to maintain pace with inflation. Now, obviously that hasn't quite maintained pace with inflation lately, but we're, we'll get back to that uh, to that option. Otherwise, if you've got a $5,000 a month policy, you're, you're gonna get a flat $5,000. If you've got COLA on it, that benefit is gonna increase over time in the event that you are on claim. Keep in mind, COLA is only paid when you are on claim and it's it's after the first year of claim. Then we have a catastrophic benefit. Uh, what catastrophic benefit does in, for most carriers is it increases the coverage to actually pay out 100% of your income, but 
you have to lose two of your six activities of daily living. Now, keep in mind, if you lose two of your six ADLs, you've not qualified for nursing home care, all right? The carriers have realized that if you've lost two of your six ADLs, you're never going back to work again. And if that does happen, your need for income has dramatically increased because of the care that you need. So they will actually replace 100% of your income um, versus a percentage of that uh, based on the, the disability portion only, okay? So uh, I, I like that uh, piece of it, and that's typically not a very expensive addition to a policy. What the uh, middle income carriers do is, is a lot of times we've got a two-year or five-year benefit period on their plans. They actually extend the benefit period to pay longer versus paying more money, which I, I appreciate too. They're gonna, if they're not gonna return to work again, you need a longer longer benefit period. And a lot of times our, our blue collar and our middle income clients don't always have the capability to do that. Todd, how long do these payouts go for? Oh, uh, basically we, we can, we can a lot of times what we will do, our best effort is to try to, especially on like on a residual policy, residual mm -hmm. rider, we will try to have that match whatever benefit period is put on the policy. So if they have an age 65 benefit period, Residual could pay all the way up to age 65. Um, mm -hmm. Catastrophic, it, you know, it, those are typically put on age 65 or age 70, 67, age 70 type of benefit periods anyway. So mm -hmm. th that part's already taken care of. Uh, COLA will increase until their benefit period uh, has been completed for that valid claim. So if you have an age 65, you could have COLA for, you know, 30, 40 years, whatever, however long you happen to be on the claim, which is, which is really nice. And I think the, the big thing to specify with all of these is that this is supposed to cover you to get to your retirement. So strategically right. speaking, DI is kind of to correlate when Social Security is supposed to start. So if you can no yep. longer deem to get your paycheck, it's it's going to get you through your working years. So once again, as we go through this process, understanding the protection and the foundation this is the stuff to get you to retirement, but we also still have to have that conversation. This is protection. And then what are you doing to accumulate and grow your assets as well? So um, that's why I say like, always make sure that when you're, when you're talking about this, they understand that the buck stops at about 65, 67 or 70, right? 70 is the mm -hmm. longest. So um, it's always good to just make sure that people are, are understanding when they get their benefits and for how long. Right. And I, and so let me, let me address two other things here really quick, because th th these questions will come up when we talk about two year, five year benefit plans. And we'll talk a little bit more about this when we, when we visit about our blue, blue collar and middle income carriers, because their policies do have a lot of two year and five year benefit periods involved with this. I hear too frequently that their client will not take a policy unless it has age 65 or age 67 benefit period on it. And I, there's a reason I'm bald, okay? Um, that may not be the only reason, um, but that that excuse drives me crazy because at the end of the day, wouldn't you rather have your bills paid for two or five years and not and be able to have time to figure it out or be able to have time to get better and get back to work versus saying I'm not gonna do anything at all because I can't have age 65 or age 67 benefits. While there, here's what, so here's, this brings on another point. While there is no average disability, the average length of a disability, if a client hits 90 days industry-wide is two and a half years. So if we have a five-year benefit period on a policy, it'll cover the vast majority of things that could occur to a client. Now, could there be situations where they, may not ever return to work again, 100%, right? So a five-year benefit period isn't going to be good for necessarily everybody, but the average duration of a claim is two and a half years when you hit the 90-day window to start a claim. Um, why wouldn't we do that, okay? Point number two that I wanted to make was uh, the misnomer with disability is that it will always cover 60% of your income. That's actually not true. Uh, the lower the income, the higher the percentage they will cover. Sometimes we can get carriers to go 75, even 80% on lower incomes. We get to that magical 60% number in with most carriers when we get to about $100,000 of income. And when we start peaking over the $100,000 mark, 
the percentage of income replacement actually tends to drop off. So we have, as Phil was talking about earlier, we've got that physician that's making $400,000 a year. They're not going to get 60% of their $400,000. I can promise you that. They may get 40 or 45% of that $400,000. The question comes, well, why? I disagree with how the carriers state this, um, but they feel that when you get to a certain level of income, there's a bunch of discretionary income that they're there to cover a lifestyle and make sure the bills are paid. They're not there to fund vacation homes. They're not there to fund vacations. Uh, they, you know, th those types of things, you know, do, do you really need the four, four cars? Um, you know, they say, no, I say, I think you're wrong. You've earned that lifestyle and you shouldn't have to sacrifice it. And for high income earners in another session, um, when we talk about Lloyd's, I'm going to show you how to protect that extra piece. Okay. So um, as income goes up, you're not going to get 60%. You're going to get less than 60%. It's still going to be a good number, um, but we can supplement that through other, through other fashions. I just want to make sure that we're fully clear that it's when, when you ask for an illustration from us and we send it back and you go, well, I did the math on this. Why isn't this 60%? No, it's not 60% because your client's making $300,000 a year. It, the percentage is going to go down. So my question to you is, what's the best plan? Okay, is it one of those things? No, um, there is no single best plan design. It comes back to your client's particular situation, all right? And it's our job here at North Central DI to design these cases for you, Okay based upon the information that you're providing us and uh, conversations either via email or on the phone, we will weed out and put together the best case design and, and uh, opportunity for them to have a disability policy that meets all their needs and is still affordable to them. Okay. Let's talk about that dirty four letter word underwriting. All right. There are three levels of underwriting when it comes to a disability policy. There's occupational underwriting. So as we talked about earlier, the higher the risk or the higher the claims history, the higher the premium, all right? My example is, should a roofer and an attorney pay the same rates for their disability policy? I don't think so. Uh, the roofer has much higher risk, right? They're climbing ladders, they're on roofs, they have a capability to fall, they're dealing with power tools. An attorney is basically sitting behind a desk right? Talking, typing, doing what we do pretty much all day, every day, right? They should not pay the same premium. But when it comes to claims history, that also comes into play. A good example of that happens to be dentists. Industry-wide, dentists have been terrible risk opportunities for disability carriers. They have tremendously high claims. The When we talk about own occupation in the dental space, there are numerous things that can keep a dentist from going to work that necessarily wouldn't keep you or me from going to work. So um, those things do come into play. There is financial underwriting. Oh. Disability can only ensure what you can prove. That's that's what it comes down to. There is no negotiating to say, well, you know, hey, they really need $5,000 of coverage. They you know not the $4,000 that's being offered. They can't financially justify a $5,000 benefit. So, I'm, you know, I'm sorry, this is, this is the way that it's going to be, <laughs> okay? And then medically, obviously, right? Um, we do have the potential for table ratings, exclusions on a policy, and if it comes down to it, declines, obviously, all right? I would say that most carriers do not uh, table rate, all right? Uh, they, they try to stay away from that if they can. They would rather put an exclusion on the policy. So as an example, I had shoulder surgery six months ago, and I now apply for disability coverage they're going to exclude my my shoulder because I just recently had surgery on that, okay? I tell people all the time, listen, if you bought a car that had hail damage, do you expect your insurance carrier to fix the hail damage for you? Absolutely not. You bought the car that way, okay? I came to the insurance carrier with a bum shoulder. They are not going to cover any event that I become disabled because of this shoulder. That's the way it plays out, okay? Um, policies are to, can be modified um, because of health issues. So, Sometimes if somebody has, let's say, a, a mental nervous issue, okay, they've had depression or anxiety history, so on and so forth, they may shorten the benefit period. They wanted an age 65 benefit period. Maybe the underwriters are saying, hey, listen, we'll, we'll take you on as an acceptable risk, but we'll only do it if we can put a five-year benefit period on your policy. 
or they may say, hey, um, you know, uh, Todd, you're, you're, you know, you, you've uh, had some back issues in the past. Um, we can't put you on, on that 60 day wait, uh, wait, you know, elimination period that you wanted. Um, we need to bump you out to, to 90 days or you had a 90 day and we need to bump you out to 180 days because of your back. Those are some of the offers that we can see out there based upon on that health history. And it is very important. Pre-screening, okay, your field underwriting is paramount and it greatly affects the placement ratio. I promise you this, okay? The better field underwriting you can do and the better questions that you guys ask from a health perspective, tell me what medications you're taking, okay? Why are you taking them? Tell me what surgeries you've had in the last five years. Do you have sleep apnea, right? Uh, what have you been to the doctor for outside of a normal cold or, or flu, you know, in the last five years? These are some things that you can ask your ask your clients to help pre-screen them. The better detail we get, the better offer we can get for you guys, because at the end of the day, we don't want surprises when it comes to underwriting. We're not going to like those surprises. Let's get off the policy and let's talk about uh, group coverage for a second. This was one thing that I really want to hammer home. We hear a lot of times from producers, well, they've got coverage through work, so they don't need an individual disability policy. That's absolutely not true. Okay, I promise you that's not true. And here's a fine example of that. In this particular illustration, we've got a client making $75,000 a year or $6,250 a month. That's 100% of their income. After their taxes, they get 70% of their, their take-home pay, all right? So they're down to, to $4,375 a month, all right? We're used to our take-home pay. We're not accustomed to our gross pay. That's the way it plays out for everybody, right? Now, their group benefit says that we'll cover 60% of your income to a maximum of $5,000. That's a, that's a very typical group-sponsored employer plan, all right? So if I become disabled, I'm actually taking a 10% take-home pay cut, so now I'm down to $3,750. But here's the caveat. I completely forgot to take into account that group benefits are being written off by the employer in their taxes. So now that 60% that I thought I was getting is now considered taxable income to me as the policyholder, and I don't get 60% take-home pay. I'm getting 42% take-home pay. So now I just took a gigantic hit. I just took a, what's that, 28% cut from my, my normal take-home pay. That hurts. It hurts a lot. Now, these are cheap benefits, and, and if it's employer paid, typically they're free. Have your client take those. Let's not get rid of those benefits. I'm saying let's supplement those benefits. So what we're willing to offer a client in this particular scenario, based on $75,000 of income, is we leave their group plan put in place, and the carrier is willing to offer an additional $1,600 of tax-free benefit. And we've got them back up to 68% of income replacement. Now, 70% to 68% of take-home pay, not such a big deal. They can probably live with that, right? 70% to 42% take-home pay, that causes a big, big problem. So don't stop just because somebody says that they have a policy through their employer. Ask the question, well, who's paying the premium? If the employer pays the premium, it's going to be taxable to them, okay? And even if they pay their own premium, what we may find is they're making enough money where they need more than what their benefit cap in that policy allows. So in, in my example, right, it was 60% to $5,000. That would put a cap at $100,000 of income. What if they're making $200,000? They become disabled. They're going to get $5,000 a month, and that $5,000 a month is going to be taxable. So that's, that's way less than half of their take-home pay. So it, it turns out to be a big deal. So ask the additional question and let's supplement their group plan, all right? Questions or thoughts about that? I got just two more slides here for you and we'll be wrapped up for the day. We had uh, a question here. If a client gets a personal policy to supplement their group policy, then later changes jobs where there is no group policy, can they change their benefit amount accordingly? So that's a great, that's a great question. In, in that supplemental policy, so the group policy does not go with them, obviously you're right. Um, that ceases to exist when they terminate their employment. Um, if we put one of the future increase options 
in their in their supplemental policy that's an individually owned policy, yes, we could increase their benefit in the event that their new employer does not offer any disability coverage at all. Or if they don't want to take that coverage and they just want simple individual coverage, 100%, we can do that. And we wouldn't have to go back through underwriting and they wouldn't have to take a look at any medical history as long as we put a future increase option on their on their plan. Great question. And uh, I was going to say we got a uh, we're a little bit over, Todd. So just uh, yep, I will wrap it up here up. real quick. All right, uh, cool. Here's here's two great icebreakers. All right, and, and th this one is an old one, but a good one, and it, it never ceases to to work. Job A versus job B. So you're in front of a client, and this works for any income. We'll just use round numbers. You tell the client, listen, I've got job A. Job pay A pays you $100,000 a year. But if you become sick or hurt and can't work, you get nothing. Or I can give the option of taking job B. Job B pays you slightly less, but if you become sick or hurt and can't work, you get $60,000 a year tax-free. Which job would you like to take? Of course, everybody chooses job B. It's the exact same job. I've just simply taken out a disability premium from it. Okay. When we talk about premiums, clients grossly overestimate the amount of premium that this is going to. We want premiums to be between one and 3% of their income. That's very affordable. Hey, if we could take 3% of your income to protect the other 97%, would you do it? 100%. Okay. So we want, we want these policies to be, be very affordable. Last slide for you the money machine, right? There, there are hundreds of different examples of this, right? But if you had a money machine in your house and every time uh, that, that time of the month hit and you needed to pay your bills and you push the button, it spent out enough money for you to pay your bills, would you insure that money machine? I guarantee you, you would. Well, guess what, Mr. and Mrs. Client? You are the money machine, okay? It's corny, it's stupid, right? But it, but it works, it makes them think about it, right? Um, you know, it's the, it's the, the, um, Goose that lays the golden eggs, right? Would you would you insure it? One hundred percent, you would, right? Well, you would insure the money machine. So you are the one that uh, has the capability of making sure that your bills get paid. We need to make sure that that income is properly protected. That is all for me. Um, if unless you guys have any additional questions, there's my contact information. Um, Tony Johnson Crawford also is here with us at North Central DI, and she helps me with all of the uh, the producers at Three Mark. So feel free to reach out to to either of us with questions for quote requests, for um, any, anything that comes up. Happy to help you guys out um, from that perspective. Is there anything else before we wrap up, Phil, that you can think of? No, uh, what I would say is uh, everything that you you said today has just been fantastic. And uh, I encourage everybody to uh, be on same bat time, same bat schedule next week. Uh, we're going to go to part two, which if I recall, is the difference between blue collar, white collar, what type of opportunities? Is that what we have next? Correct. We'll talk about the carriers specifically in those spaces, why we use them, how, where they're good, and uh, we can visit about examples of policies in there as well. So yep. it won't, now, that one will not take as long as this one did. I can promise you that. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> a good question uh, for our Californian. Uh, can these cover the marijuana businesses or are they a strict... Uh, as the uh, life insurance side, that's yeah, a good so, one. Too. Uh, we we do have the capability of of covering that uh, that industry. Um, it is not through our traditional carriers, okay. Uh, but we can we can cover owners' personal income uh, of the uh, distribution or grow operations, and um, and then we can actually insure them on the life insurance side with key person or buy sell agreements, but it, it is through the Lloyd's, our Lloyd's outlets. It is not the, the traditional carriers will, they still stray away from that industry, <laughs> but, it can, it, but it can be done. So the answer those, is yes. Those Brits. Yeah. So, yeah. all right. Well, yeah, this is a, these are all great uh, questions. And uh, like I said before, if you missed it uh, or you want to catch up on it again, I will upload this to the at Valor financial website, uh, excuse me, YouTube channel. Uh, so if you want to catch up on it again, if you miss something, uh, and, and once again, we do these every week. Uh, if you are new to Valor or want to hear more, you can always email me as well, phil 
at Valor FS, like Frank Sam or financialspecialist.com. And uh, would love to see uh, how we can serve, help, and, and, and uh, you know, help you build your community. So, Todd, thank you again. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, again, we've got one more uh, for November. Then we got that Thanksgiving. Two more of Todd in the uh, December month. One of me. And then we wrap for the year. So can't believe we're already there. Uh, thank you guys again. Have a great rest of your day and great weekend if we don't talk. See you guys.